So in our considerations of the causes of anemia, we've considered reduced production of red blood cells. We now want to go in and look at increased destruction of red blood cells once they've been produced in the red bone marrow. So we're thinking about increased destruction of red cells. Now, when you break up red cells, that's called hemo. Hemolysis. So these conditions are called hemolytic anemias. So hemo is blood, lytic or lysis means to break up. The red cells, the cells are being broken up. And because the red cells are broken up within the body, the iron that was in the red cells is retained. And because the iron is retained in the body, usually these patients don't develop iron deficiency because the iron is retained. So what can cause the hemolytic anemia is what can cause the excessive breakup of the red blood cells. Well, this can be for genetic reasons. The several genetic conditions can predispose to this. And perhaps the best known of these is the sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease resulting in sickle cell anemia. This is an autosomal recessive condition. Both parents need to carry the gene. And the cells change from being the normal biconcave discs to being sickle shaped. But another genetic disorder that can affect the shape of the red blood cells is sphero. spherocytosis and you can probably see the sphero bit sounds a bit like sphere so here we get spherical circular red blood cells and the key thing with these is that because the red cells are abnormal they're recognized by the monocyte macrophage system what used to be called the reticuloendothelial system and these uh, cells based particularly in the spleen will break up these cells because they're abnormal. Or an abnormality of haemoglobin can also cause uh, hemolysis. Thalassemia. Well, you might have heard of the enzyme deficiency, G6PD where there can be significant hemolysis if the patient are given particular foods or drugs. So there's these genetic causes of the hemolytic anemias where we have increased destruction of the red blood cells, but the iron is retained in the body. And the other forms are acquired. Or if you like, using terminology from previous videos, these are endogenous factors and these are exogenous factors. These arise from within the individual, these arise from outside the individual. So for example, some drugs can lead to idiosyncratic hemolytic reactions, as can some toxins. Um, some snake venoms, for example. A range of infections can lead to hemolysis. And there can be immunological reactions. I can spell it. Immunological reactions. And another one is a mechanical trauma. Long distance runners, for example, um, because they're putting their foot down hard all the time, they're gonna break up some of their red blood cells. 
Well, another classic one we used to get was with the old-fashioned mechanical heart valves where some red blood cells were physically broken up, resulting in hemolysis. And another one, unfortunately, is malaria. Such a scourge in many parts of the world. The uh, plasmodium parasite lives inside the red blood cell and that can lead to hemolysis. Um, now, now anyone with uh, chronic malaria does actually usually suffer from a degree of anemia but this is particularly a problem with uh, falciparum malaria and as often particularly affects children and, uh, and pregnant women. So we've got a few causes there of the uh, increased destruction of the red cells. So th th this one is a continuation of this thinking here. And that leads us on to the, uh, the next one. And we see this is blood loss anemia. So we're now thinking about this category here. Blood loss anemia. Blood loss. So obviously the red cells and the haemoglobin are going to be in the blood and if the blood is lost we haven't got the red cells and the haemoglobin. And just before we start looking at this I think you can see if the blood is lost from the body that's going to mean that the iron is lost. So these patients can be short of iron. Body iron is depleted over time. And particularly we can test for ferritin. Ferritin is the molecule that stores iron in the body and these levels will become depleted in blood loss anemia, especially the chronic form. Now, blood loss anemia, we can divide it into the acute and we can divide it into chronic. Acute and chronic blood loss. Now, if there's acute blood loss through trauma, for example, then that can lead to low blood volumes. Hypovolemia. Blood volume can be lost, well, will be lost. Hypo, low, vol, volume, emia, blood. But what happens, of course, is that um, we drink and tissue fluid is moved osmotically from the tissue spaces and from the intracellular fluid into the blood. So the fluid part of the blood can be replaced relatively quickly but it's harder to replace the red cell. So if we're replacing the fluid part, but not replacing the red cells, this can lead to hemodilution. So within a few hours, the blood volume can be restored, but it's diluted. Now there are some spare red blood cells in the spleen, about the equivalent of a unit of pack cells. So if you're only losing, say, 500 mils of blood, then you won't get a hemodilution effect because the red cells will be replaced from the red blood cells stored in the spleen. But more than that, and we're likely to get this hemodilution effect. And what, ha what happens is when the blood volumes, are, when the red cell volumes are low, that's going to reduce the amount of oxygen carried in the blood. That's going to be detected in the kidney and the kidney is going to produce more erythropoietin, which stimulates the red bone marrow. So <clears throat> starting after about five days to about four weeks, there's going to be increased red cell production. 
So after about four weeks, a lot of the red cells are going to be uh, replaced. And significant numbers will start to be replaced after about five days and the patient will start to have more energy again. And if we test the blood, we notice that there's a lot of young red blood cells. So because the bone marrow is stimulated, lots of new red blood cells are going to be made. And young red blood cells still retain some of the nuclear contents because in the bone marrow, the red cells are made from stem cells which do have nuclei. And what we have is an increased number of the cells called reticulocytes. Reticulocytes. So these reticulocytes are red cells that still have fragments of the nucleus left in them, indicating that they're young. But of course, to facilitate this process, the increased production of the red cells between five days and four weeks, when that starts to show in the blood, the patient's going to need factors to allow them to make the red cells. So they're going to need the protein, they're going to need the iron, they're going to need the B12. So paying attention to diet there is very important. Thinking about the chronic form of blood loss, which is the one we see mostly in pathological situations. This one's largely the trauma situation. This one's largely the medical pathological situation. What always comes to mind first is uh, GI bleeds. Bleeds into the lumen of the gastrointestinal system of the gastrointestinal tract. So for example, peptic ulcers. Now, peptic ulcers are much less common in Western countries, but still, unfortunately, remarkably common in poorer areas of the world. Because in Western countries, um, a lot of the Helicobacter pylori bacteria that cause the peptic ulceration have been eradicated with um, proton pump inhibitors and antibiotic protocols. But if you go to poorer areas of the world, unfortunately, Helicobacter is still a major problem, as are peptic ulcers. Or you might think of anything causing colitis, ulcerative colitis, for example, cancers, gastrointestinal cancers particularly, colon cancers. But other cancers can bleed small amounts of blood over a long period of time, resulting in chronic blood loss anemia. Again, if we test the blood for reticulocytes, these young, immature red cells, these will be increased because the bone marrow is trying to compensate for the hemorrhagic loss. Another common problem is uh, menorrhagia. Excessive blood loss through menstruation. For example, just simple fibroids. These benign tumours of the, uh, the uterus, the endometrium. A lot of blood loss can be lost through menstruation. I mean, blood, menstruation loses blood anyway, but uh, pathological menstruation can lead to a lot of chronic blood loss. Or another global problem is worms. Gastrointestinal helminth. Infections. So round worm, worms and flat worms will cause um, a degree of blood loss and will eat the, the nice nutrients that the person's eating. But particularly the, the hookworms are a problem here because their, their um, claws, well not the claws, their mouthpieces, go and stick into the gastrointestinal tract and, and suck the blood. Very um, significant global cause of chronic blood loss anemia. Very easy to treat with mebendazole, for example. So there we see these categories. 
anemia caused by reduced production of red cells, increased destruction of red cells, and uh, loss of blood loss anemia, hemorrhagic loss of blood cells. So quite easy to remember. In anemia, there's not enough cells produced, there's too many cells destroyed, or the red blood cells are lost.